Thank you very much for asking me to come and speak. Um, this report that I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I think was absolutely fascinating, and I think NCPOD chose very well. Um, the timing is everything in these reports. Um, mental health is coming on the agenda, so it was a good time to choose. Um, I, why was it coming on the agenda? Well, I think years of underfunding started, the cracks started to show people's mental health is perhaps not so good and they're more verbal about it. Uh, and then we have, in my department, I see 13 or 14 percent more acute mental health attendances per year. Um, the standards were all out there, everybody's busy writing standards, and yet the actual measurement of how we're doing perhaps wasn't there. <coughs> CQC were already interested. We've just had CQC, great joy, uh, and they spent a long time, in fact they sent specific mental health um, report, uh, evaluators to come and see me in the emergency department. Um, and CPOD could have also chosen the easy route. We could have just said, well let's look at patients attending uh, acute hospitals with uh, mental health problems, so an acute self-harm episode. And that would have been quite interesting in itself, and it would have been very, very revealing, but no. We went the whole hog and we looked at mental health and physical health where they coincide. You see, that's often the case. Um, we like to think of mental health as that belongs to the psychiatrist and physical health as, well, we perhaps we do that, bit, but our patients don't come in this state because they come as one whole person. So one in five of the patients the report looked at came with self-harm and the other four out of five came with their chronic mental health condition but with an acute physical condition on top. So just in the next 10 minutes I'm going to um, just give you a flavour of some of the findings of the report and then in order to, to describe what my own trust has had a go at doing and also uh, tell you a little about our national initiative which is coming out of um, the report. Um, being an NC pod reviewer is a bit like, um, well, it's wading essentially. I think they should give you wellies. Um, <laughs> I spent hours, I spent four or five days wading through <coughs> patients' notes. And I waded and I waded, and I very rarely found anything in the medical notes or the nursing notes that asked the patient, How are you? How's your mood? How are you managing being in hospital? Um, <coughs> how's your paranoia? You know, whatever. It's rarely there. I read billions of water load scores and, you know, temperature normal and all this nonsense, but very little about the big thing that is part of the patient's life that they live with all the time. So it's not surprising then that we found inadequate documentation on all sorts of things. Mental health history, risk assessments where they were needed, it's pretty poor. Uh, mental capacity assessments, pretty poor. They were done, but they weren't necessarily done well. Our one-to-one -one observations where we saw that somebody had a potential risk um, were very, very poorly documented. Um, when a patient was referred to liaison psychiatry, there was often a delay, um, and that delay was said to be because the patient wasn't medically fit. Now, I've trained all my juniors to go, fit for what? <laughs> we'll come to that later. Um, I think hospitals are a bit behind on their policies, particularly in how they manage the Mental Health Act. It's a minefield, it's really complex. You have to have panels of people that can do reviews and all this sort of thing. We didn't have that. Um, Medicines reconciliation is delayed, so you're much less, much more likely to be missing one of your mental health drugs than you are one of your drugs for your physical condition. And when that's something like clozapine, that has really profound consequences. There were some good examples, hooray! There are great examples of where liaison psychiatry review actually added to a patient's overall care and better outcome. And it was clear that when, when a liaison psychiatry department was plan accredited, that's their own national accreditation network, um, standards of care were better. So what were the recommendations? Here's some very broad recommendations. Um, we need to be asking about mental health. We need to be treating people's mental health. We need to be taking it into account when we ask about consent. Um, discharge planning, it comes into every part of a person's life if they're living with an enduring mental health condition. Um, there was a suggestion of joint care with liaison psychiatry. When I was first a consultant looking at how our mental health team uh, interacted with our ED team, we talked about parallel assessment. And then you realise, well, actually, is that just parallel and the two never meet? <laughs> actually, joint care, where we talk to each other, is much better. Um, we need as trusts to integrate liaison psychiatry fully into our trust. Now, the problem is they're paid for by somebody different. Generally, they're, they're a mental health trust is a completely separate organisation. Um, they're actually paid for by the, com the commissioners, give the money to us, and then we commission the mental health trust, and somewhere we have to all join it all together. Mm. 
But where we can get them involved um, in trust governance and strategy, things get better, and we're getting there in our trust with that now. Sharing information is a nightmare. They all write in different notes. Um, I have, I try to, I can just about get into their notes. I'm the only person out of my 23 colleagues that's managed to keep the access because they've got two passwords and they change at different times. And I only probably access the mental health notes every one or two weeks, and I'm the mental health lead. Other people probably would only access them every three or four weeks, so no chance of keeping their password. Um, and we discovered that we needed to train people in mental health issues, but then how do you do that in a meaningful way? So that was a sort of broad recommendation. So there was some really specific stuff. Medicine's reconciliation is poor and, and therefore unsafe. Um, so that's work with pharmacy and um, prescribers. Um, we know that patients with enjoying mental health conditions die between 10 and 20 years earlier um, than people without. And a lot of that has to do with prevention of your standard causes of death, so smoking cessation, alcohol, harm reduction, blood pressure monitoring, all these things. Um, specifically, mental health act processes were, were not robust, and the recommendation that those need to be sorted out and data collection needs to be better. And unsurprisingly, coding is also tricky. Um, and if you can help with, if we can sort out our coding, that does help us audit stuff and then get the funding to follow where the need is. So those were the, some broad recommendations and some specific ones. So the challenge of this report, how does a report tackle um, organisation that takes place in silos? How do we change that? How do we get that working? Um, how does a report start to change attitudes? People don't understand mental health. They don't mean to be stigmatising, um, but they just don't, they don't get it necessarily. And there are only a few quick fixes. So I was thinking about what's, you know, what's a lovely picture to have at this point, and I was thinking about climbing. I'm not a climber at all, um, but I quite like watching some of these challenges. Um, it's a multi-pitch climb. So you have to start at the bottom, bottom, set yourself a target, do that bit, and then think, right, what's my next target? And I think that's how we're having to tackle it. So in my own hospital, we started with the policies, um, and that was the relatively easy bit. Um, the policies have been written. We've had to, we've had to work really closely with our mental health law um, uh, people in, in our mental health trust, and that's provided good relationships. Uh, we've had to go and educate the exec. My exec doesn't know what our section 136 is. <coughs> when a police, a policeman brings somebody who's got a mental health problem into a place of safety. So yesterday I wrote them a one-page report on what happened with the change in legislation last year, why we're seeing more of these, and what, as a trust, we're doing about it. I can't expect them to know everything, so I need to be educating them. We have got fairly strong governance structures now, so that we look at incidents together with our mental health colleagues, with security, with the paediatricians, um, with lots of different people in the trust. And then there's the nitty gritty of uh, me persuading somebody else to get um, the, the trust board to get someone else to take on various bits that you know myself and the mental health team can't do. So getting pharmacy to step up getting the smoking committee to actually talk about um, how to access smoking cessation advice for people who are perhaps not so easy to talk to, um, and how, to, how are we going to out, go out auditing some of our processes. And the next thing I think we need to do is to get more patient experience. So I need to get the, the powers complaints um, back up, up the chain so that people know that we still need to be working on stuff. Um, we need some effective mandatory training, and that needs to be different for different groups of people, because uh, the porters, the secretaries, the receptionists, they probably need a little bit of training. My HCAs, who are band three or four, who will sit with a patient who's acutely disturbed in order to keep them safe, they definitely need some training. But that's different from someone who's come through medical school and knows a bit about mental capacity and mental health. I'm actually hoping that someone else will have created this training for me somewhere, and I'm just, I thought if I wait six months, maybe it would appear post MC pod. I haven't found it yet. We may have to write it ourselves. And then we're going to have to put reminders in patient notes, backstops that in the nursing record that says, have you asked about this patient's mood and their sleep, or whatever. I don't know how we're going to do that. Um, how I conduct incident reviews has changed post mc -Pod because I'm seeing the same themes coming up when we look at mental health incidents. There are lots of really nasty mental health incidents out there. Some of you might have been aware of the HSIB. They produced a report about three or four weeks ago now about a lady who had had lots of contact with her GP and, and the ED, and after four or five contacts, the follow-up didn't work, and she took her own life. 
My own my current thing that I'm investigating is a lady who has personality disorder. Uh, she presented with non-epileptic seizures. Um, she'd had two section 136s in the previous three or four days before coming into the emergency <coughs> department. When she came in, she'd been found in a ditch having had a, some sort of a seizure. Um, it wasn't clear it was non- non-epileptic. She got admitted. She got taken over by neurology. All very good care. But nobody, not my ED registrar, not the neurologist, not the medic, said, well, how are you at the moment? And then the uh, neurologist said, well, we referred her to liaison psychiatry because that's what we do with everybody with non-epileptic seizures. But they didn't ask how she was. Um, she absconded once. That should have been a little bit of a, a sign. She was found outside the trust having another seizure. The nurses then said, oh, we'd quite like to special this lady, but we haven't got the staff. And they escalated it up, didn't get any help. Uh, this, the neurologist assessed her capacity and decided that in the context of her personality disorder, she did have capacity to make decisions. In particular, she had capacity to decide to leave. But, <coughs> unbeknown to them, psychiatrists had seen this lady and said, we're really worried, she's not really communicating that well with us. We want a mental health act assessment tomorrow. They al- the neurologist allowed this lady to leave the ward and you can guess what happened next. She is still alive. Uh, she put herself under a train and suffered some trauma, but did well, and in fact, uh, fortunately, out of that. So, difficult, but all the same themes are there. No one talked to the patient. No one really understood how the Mental Health Act worked in the context of the Mental Capacity Act. The nurses wanted to help, but they didn't really know how, and they didn't have the, 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 the staffing to do it. So it's a bit depressing, really. <coughs> Is some of this stuff too difficult? Well, there's some stuff we're parked at the moment. How do we send a discharge summary to the mental health team without knowing who they are and which consultant, and it changes regularly? How do we get this shared access to notes? How do I get funding for something that's not going to save money? If anyone can tell me that, please please let me know. Because currently, my commissioners won't give me money for a 24-hour liaison psychiatry service unless it will save money. Giving good care doesn't necessarily save money. Sometimes it costs money. The last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, nationally. So um, one, of the, one of the things we discovered that the liaison psychiatrists or more often the nurses involved in those teams or crisis teams will say, I don't want to come and assess this patient until I know they've got no medical problem that might be causing their mental health problem. And I want to know they're absolutely ready to discharge, otherwise I don't want to come and see them. So a patient can be left for several hours or even a day without any input for their mental health from an expert whilst those people wait for the medics to sort them all out. That's not good care. Um, And it's not usually what liaison psychiatrists will be endeavouring to do. So uh, four colleges have got together and we're working to define how mental health teams should work. Um, We're talking about dignity and equality of access, working (coughs) side by side, not in parallel. Um, And when when a, a, a clinician in the acute hospital asks for help from a liaison psychiatrist just to say, what do you want? So if you want an assess- if you just want an assessment, it is fair to then say, when is the patient fit for that assessment? But actually, quite often we need some advice. How is this patient? What's their background? Or maybe we need some support. Maybe we don't know quite what to do about that patient's capacity. So the patient may be, actually, we just need some help now. The patient may be fit for assessment, fit for discharge, but not fit for anything. But we need, still need your help, so please come. So this is a big bit of work. Again, it's the same process. Um, Making the policy first is the easy bit. Then it's involving all the groups, communicating that out, and then we need to evaluate it. So we need to get CQC on our side. We're putting this this standard in our um, RCHEM audit, and also PLAN will also be auditing. That's the uh, Psychiatric Liaison Accreditation Network. (coughs) Um, So in some way, there are huge changes needed um, to improve mental health care in acute hospitals, it's a really tough, tough nut to crack. There's few quick wins. There's big structural changes that are needed. Perhaps um, liaison psychiatry just need to be employed by the trust where they're working and not be part of some other organisation. We need good governance and good structures. Relationship building is really important. Uh, We need meaningful training, and I'm not quite sure what that looks like yet, but we're working on it. And I think where MTPOD works best is where it's followed up. Um, with audit and evaluation. So CQC on our backs is potentially quite a good thing. Thank you.